Welcome to Softcore History. Welcome back to Softcore History. I am your host for the week, Dan Register. Jake Goldman is out. Uh, he abandoned us, he did. actually. He said, I'm kind of tired of this life. Uh, I think chasing this podcast dream is irresponsible and childish. And he was like, I'm just growing up. So we suspended him for the week. Yeah. We were like, why don't you just get your head out of your ass? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Come back in a week. See what you think. Get shit straight. Yeah. Uh, no, apparently he's sick again. He thinks so. he has COVID. Probably. Um, he is fully vaxxed, but he says he, he might have COVID. I don't know if he went to get tested today or if he's just chugging like Dayquil at home. Has he had it before? I don't think he has. He hasn't, actually. No. He, him and his wife didn't, didn't ever get it. So, of course, They're clean. that other voice you hear, the regular voice you hear, Rob Fox. Uh, we can skip past that. We won't yeah, really need to ask here. about you. There's nothing here. Uh, but, yeah, we brought Coop back. I'm back. Thank you for having me on the show. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You're well, our, thanks. Thank Jake yeah, for really, catching Jake. COVID. Thank you, Jake. You're I kind of like our bullpen, our bullpen guy. <laughs> Call yeah, you in. Pinch hitter. Any, yeah. Any, anytime you need me, I'm here. So I, we figured we'd call you in because we're, uh, we're going – you're our military expert. And that was actually a little bit of a, a shock to me when I came in today because I honestly did spend about an hour reading about the bass player from Led Zeppelin before <laughs> I came in Because <laughs> today's topic is John Paul Jones. We, uh, we teased it on the Instagram. Uh, yeah, you're, you're familiar with the, the bassist and keyboardist of Led Zeppelin. Yeah, it's slightly familiar with the uh, – he was an admiraler. Something along those lines, right? He was, a, he was a Navy man in the in the U.S. Uh, yeah, a lot of people in the Colonial Navy, I guess you could call it. A lot I don't of know what people kind of consider him the father of the U.S. Navy. Yeah, he was yeah. the first Navy's first like badass. I it's actually, I'm surprised. This is a kind of a, a bit of a normie topic for you. Yeah, well, obviously it's Jake's week. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You kind of had to. So this Jake, was last minute. This was a fill in. This uh, is episode 50, yeah. by the way. It's kind of a milestone. Another. Oh, wow. That's another eyebrow raiser, by the way. Do you think Jake just didn't have a topic? And he was like, <coughs> <laughs> you got to think. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. I, I, mean, I believe it. We put enough with, pressure on him as is. Yeah. Coming up with the topic for episode 50, that's, that's a lot of pressure because that is a milestone. Yeah. It's a milestone number. Yep. This is a milestone man. <laughs> John Paul Jones. Originally born John Paul. Jones was a name he adopted later on in life. We'll get to that. His last name was Paul. John, uh, yeah, John Paul. That's weird. <laughs> Got to think he was related to uh, the Paul brothers. Yeah, I think Chris Paul, maybe there was some uh, slight relationship there. Chris Paul? No, I'm talking Logan Paul. Oh, oh yeah. man. <laughs> I would actually fucking... The more famous Paul brothers. I would yeah. hate it so much if they were descended from John Paul Jones. I bet they are. Oh, I would. God, that would be such that, a slap in the face to him. It would be so fucking terrible because the second they found out about it, You'd never hear the end of it. I mean, we know what his famous quote is. You'll probably get to that at some point. But mm. that would be that would be writ scrawled across every one of their stupid boxing shorts. It'd be on each fucking glove. Like they, it, it would be so fitting for their career now. Yeah, the quote. Yes, we'll get to that too later yeah. on. But yeah, he was born on uh, the southwest coast of Scotland in 1747 to a family of gardeners. Uh, so didn't grow up in nobility, but he was nobility adjacent because they worked for a bunch of noblemen. <laughs> <laughs> Not enough. really. Sure. Nobility adjacent. Yeah, like trimming that's their like hedges a, and that's stuff. That's like a yeah. prisoner being like, yeah, I'm freedom adjacent because I, I know people who aren't in prison. <laughs> Amazon warehouse employees saying they're billionaire adjacent. <laughs> Close enough. Listen, He's Bezos ch- contributed <laughs> that rocket to every single Amazon worker, okay? They played a piece in history. He did it for all of them. That seemed like such an insult when he was saying that he had to thank the Amazon employees because they helped pay for it. You know well, what? Yeah, by not That's probably more than the pharaohs did for the people who built the pyramids. Hey, true. Right? You know Khufu's name. You know anyone else's name? <laughs> Fucking not. no. Did the, well, the pharaohs at least let them scribble some... Uh, Graffiti all over the. Did, did they let him? Eh, yeah, true. But Bezos didn't let any Amazon employees. Were they micromanaging the uh, the building of the pyramids? <laughs> Dude, maybe. I mean, it's mathematically, it seems like it was pretty micromanaged. <laughs> but not not on the Pharaoh level. 
Yeah, he was probably, you know, had an engineer probably do. He's just like, yeah, just make it, make it hot. But I mean, was Bezos micromanaging the rocket math? <laughs> I'd like, like to think so. I like well, to think made it so. into space, so I don't think he was. Yeah, I kind of feel like that's a no. He's an idea guy. Yeah, but he came up with the rocket design for sure. Oh, definitely. I don't understand why they're so mad. Optically. Like, Probably it's scribbled funnier, out on a notebook when he was a teenager. Yeah, it's funny to take your short, white, stubby dick and shove it into space. <laughs> like, that's funny. That's, that's great. I don't know why everyone's so mad. Uh, yeah, why wouldn't you? Yeah. If you had the money to do it? I'd do it. I would do it every time. Yeah. So uh, John Paul Jones, age 13, I guess he was done picking weeds, being a gardener, uh, decided to hit the open sea. Oh, he didn't like being nobility adjacent anymore? <laughs> sure Wasn't didn't. good enough for him? Yeah. It's highfalutin gardener over here. Pretty common choice for those who grew up in the Scottish coast who wanted to leave. Uh, he got the blessing of his family and became an apprentice aboard the merchant ship Friendship, sailing out of the northern English county Cumberland under Captain Benson. Pretty grim that, like, it's always a better option in this time, unless you're rich, to just go live on a shitty boat. Yeah, because the friendship was about 80 feet by 22 feet, so very small ship to hit the open sea. Uh, crew of 28. Yeah, he's not, uh, he's not on a Disney cruise here. Yeah, that's pretty similar to the size of the, I think they were called caravels that Columbus used. To, to make his famous voyage. You guys probably heard of it at some point. Of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Caravelle, we all. <laughs> Who could forget? <laughs> yeah. Who could? Uh, small ship, but would make a yearly voyage from Whitehaven to Barbados to Fredericksburg, Virginia, where his older brother, William Paul, so the Paul brothers, the original Paul brothers, <laughs> had settled in the colonies as a tailor in an unhappy, loveless marriage. Uh, they, well, they, they made note of this, by the way. The imp- <laughs> to be fair, though, yeah, it's impressive that that has lasted through the ages, by the way. They're like, <laughs> like that, that They're fucking like, William made it. Paul's <laughs> wife was a real bitch. <laughs> <laughs> like, that is jotted down in history. Like, that, didn't, that wasn't lost to history. People know that John Paul Jones' brother had a shitty wife. Or maybe he was a shitty husband. But either way, it was just a dead marriage. But, by the, but does it count as a bad marriage if, like, they knew other people in love and they were love adjacent? <laughs> You got to think at least one couple in Fredericksburg, Virginia was at least in love. So, yes, they were. They were, they love, were adjacent. love adjacent. Yeah. He was happy to always bail on his wife when his younger brother came in. So, uh, he, you know, his brother would make his annual voyage. And I guess this, would, this made a bit of an impression on John Paul because this is where he starts to really fall in love with the colonies and get excited for the prospects of the colonies moving forward. He's just like, I see something here. And this is what, the 1750s at this point? Um, so he was born in 47. So, so 1760s. Yeah, 60s. Okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. Because he started 13. Okay. Starting young. So he would just go to Virginia and bro down with his brother? Yep. And it made, Business his, trip. And it yeah. made his brother hate his marriage? No, his brother already oh. hated his marriage. Um, so whenever his brother came into, his, whenever John came into town, he was very happy to leave his wife at home and then just kind of show John around. Kinda, yeah. Kind of sounds like he had a terrible wife. If you're the terrible husband, it's usually the spouse that's, that's leaving, I would think. Yeah. I think he was probably pissed. He's like, babe, I'm going out. She's like, where are you going? I'm going out. My brother's in town. <laughs> it took him five months to get here. God, fuck. <laughs> so after the French and Indian War, England was in a bit of a financial downturn. So the friendship was sold and its crew disbanded. So now 16 years old. John Paul had three years sailing experience with no mer- merchant ship gigs, really hitting his zip recruiter search. You know, he's why? just kind of hitting Indeed. I don't get why that would affect his job. Like the British being in debt from the French and Indian War, wouldn't they need to trade They're merchant more sailors. I, I don't know why, but apparently the ship, I guess the owner, just kind of came into financial so trouble. There was a recession, sold. I guess, or something. Recession hit England, and uh, they sold the ship. Crew disbanded, so he was unemployed. By the way, uh, the best part about this, this is just a little aside, is that the whole reason that the revolution started or like got sparked essentially was the taxation or whatever, and the taxation was because of the debt from the French, French and, and Indian, Indian War, War yeah. and the French and Indian War happened because the colonists were like, eh, protect us from the French and the Indians. <laughs> And then we were bad that they did. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I mean, there's good times. Yeah, there's <laughs> several butterfly effects. From it. <laughs> it's just a funny chain of events. Uh, so, sixteen, kind of, uh, you know, he's 
He's unemployed. He Typical. took so he took a job in one of the few recession proof industries, uh Blackburden, aka slave trade. Ah. So uh you can yeah. cancel John Paul Jones already. <laughs> Go ahead. Father of the US. It's really more noteworthy when they aren't connected to slavery. It's insane <laughs> if they like somehow avoid it. Yeah. Yeah. So I he, don't know how I don't even know how you do at that point. Sixteen years old, he was third mate aboard the King George for two years. Uh then moved over to another Blackbird ship called Two Friends. Uh, what a fun name. <laughs> what a yeah, fun and flirty for name. A for a horrifying <laughs> trade. <laughs> yes. Uh, it would have been a little worse if they were carrying them on the French ship. Yeah. That's true. Nothing friendly there. Two I'm Friends? To think of, I'm trying to think of fun, sweet names for other horrifying occupations. They didn't really try with these ship names, by the way. Well, like... I mean, the, the friendship, the... Fucking uh, King George and then the two friends. The two friends? Yeah, it's just called Two Friends. All right. Why not? Uh, so he is the first mate on the two friends, moving his way up, you know, before ultimately feeling morally bad about what he was doing with his life. <laughs> Look, man, you ship slaves from, you, you steal human beings from their home and ship them across an ocean to be slaves a couple dozen times and, you know. You might start to wear on your conscience yeah. a little bit. Yeah. So he does uh, like one. The over under is literally about twelve. Yeah. Before it really. <laughs> he does one voyage on the two friends, uh, and then he's like, "I'm out. Of, I can't do this anymore." Eventually, refers to this as an abominable trade. He resigns. Still teenager, of course. Um, he's like about eighteen, nineteen at this point. Um, That's kind of impressive for a a teenager to come to that conclusion when there were adults that were very much not of the same mindset. I disagree. I you think... It was like a punk rock thing? Yeah, that's exactly what I was going to say. Yeah, I rebelling. think he's like, yeah. man, f- fuck the government. And like, <laughs> fuck, these, like, fuck this corporate shit, man. Corporate slave stuff. Like, fuck that. <laughs> Whereas the adults are like, grow up. We're putting the slaves on the boat, John. Well, he was right, though. But <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, <laughs> Sometimes that's right. Sometimes the team, I mean, I don't know if it's like a broken clock situation. or yeah, he sometimes was actually, it's good to actually fade life. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. The rest but, of life. But, to be you know, the, it wouldn't surprise me if at 18, 19, he was just like, fuck corporate. It was just the, <laughs> the equivalent of fuck corporations. Yeah, that, but, was him, that was his version of just being against fucking he, sellouts, man. Yeah, fucking <laughs> Uh, I, I, I don't, like to think he actually had a moral quandary. Yeah, me too. I hope so. <laughs> I, 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 I'm not trying to be like a pessimist about it. I just don't put anything past a teenager. Yeah. No. <laughs> Although, to be fair... <laughs> not, you're 18, 19 at that point. You're an adult. Yeah, that time, yeah. Oh, yeah. He's yeah. been doing this shit since he was 13. And he probably looked 30. <laughs> so, yeah, was, all right. He's an adult. Well, he, he was, was also... middle age. Yeah. Well, he is regarded, like, we'll get to it. Like, he was a handsome man, but he's only, he was a small feller. Small for the time? He's 5'5". Five five. That's not small for the time. He was small for the time. No, it, no, it is not. They made note that he was small for the time. 5'5 five five was like the average height oh. of an American male mm. in like the beginning of the 20th century. We will move past this, and I, I will rebut that later. Okay. Yeah. So uh, he hops off in Jamaica and finds a ride back to Britain with a fellow Scot aboard the aptly named vessel, the John. John just hopped on the John. I so I actually was thinking about this earlier when you were like all these ship names suck. They just like they're very early in the creative like content game, so everything's in play. Do you know what I mean? All the IPs available. All the IPs available. They so they can just do the most basic shit possible and it's new. Yeah, like at John. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Literally. Yeah. Like so I'm sure the first boat was just called the boat. <laughs> Bodie McFace face. Yeah, yeah Bodie McBoat face or whatever. Yeah, I mean, they don't, they don't have to be creative yet. No one's thought of everything. No one's thought of most things yet. They haven't started running out of usernames. It, literally, not even close. They don't have to add numbers to their handles. Yeah, no. yeah. Two friends underscore 420. <laughs> so during this voyage uh, back to Britain, both the master and the first mate died of fever. So John Paul just decides to take things into his own hands and sails uh, the John back to her home port. Happy he returned the ship and didn't just go full, like fully rogue pirate. Uh, the owners rewarded John Paul with his first command at age 20. Damn. 
Wait, so was he? He was just a passenger. He was a passenger. Decided I will just because I'll the do it. Captain and the first mate died, right. so he's just like I'll just take the ship back. I'm used to this. Jesus I know what I'm Christ, doing. The way that people got jobs back then, where it's just like you'd. If you're there when they need somebody and you're just a little bit smarter than everybody else around, yeah, they'll go ahead and hand it over. Like the battlefield commissions that they would do. You know, people with very little experience just keep moving up and up because of people above them die and they just, well, this guy can read. It's, <laughs> it's not much different than it is now. Like as long as you have the confidence and really a lanyard around your neck, you oh, can go yeah. anywhere. Yeah, the lanyard's the key. Yeah. Lanyard or a ladder will get you into any event that you want. Yes, and if you have the confidence and you don't question yourself or it doesn't seem like you're out of place, nobody, nobody has a problem with it. Yeah, I'll, I'll be honest. I didn't, it didn't take a lot of work for me to get into the uh, maternity ward the other day when my <laughs> wife was in there. Like, like they, no one looked at me twice. Like, I just walked in like I was supposed to be there. And that's VIP access. Yeah. yeah that, that's actually a little shocking that you can just walk right into a maternity ward. And, and you yeah. just take a baby. The, I was about to say, the, NI, the NICU might as well have been a fucking produce section. Like, you just grab what I need and fucking go. It was a farmer's market for babies. Walking by, squeezing their heads. Ah, no, this yeah, no, nah, not soft, right. Overripe. Yeah, it's a soft skull. <laughs> Uh, so John and six crew members made one trouble-free voyage to Jamaica under his command, but the second trip on the John when he was captain was a little bit rockier. I've had a lot of rocky trips on the John. Yeah. Hey, hey. that's why we have you here, Coop. Who <laughs> needs Jake? diarrhea? <laughs> Who needs Goldman? No one. You hear that, Jake? I know you're listening. Episode 50, and you missed out. Milestone episode. You better be here for the one year. <laughs> Which is in like two weeks. Yeah, two weeks, by the way. yeah. It's kind of like, this is kind of like a like weak-ass milestone considering the one year is two weeks from now. Right, because we haven't missed an episode. Right. So I'd imagine it's two weeks. Yeah, yeah something probably. Like yeah, give or take. Uh, so a crew member was bitching about wages and claimed John uh, Paul's discipline was unnecessarily cruel. So the claims were <laughs> initially dismissed, but the crew member dies a few weeks later. The death was linked to yellow fever, but John Paul's reputation as a player's coach took a hit. Oh, well, to be fair, it doesn't help John Paul in terms of the wage and discipline situation that he used to ship slaves places. <laughs> it's, yeah, a it's a double strike. Slightly skewed view on, on what people should be paid for their labor. Right. And the discipline with which labor is procured. <laughs> yeah. So the crew member that dies... Um, kind of comes back as a problem later on because his a zombie not as a zombie but no. his family is a kind of influential in the uh the biz it doesn't oh in the it biz. wasn't just a normal crew member i was about to say uh, if you're a crew member on a boat at that time i a barely believe you have a family and b <laughs> don't believe you're influential in any way whatsoever <laughs> but right but this was this guy was like a kid this essentially a kid who just got an internship. Oh uh, yeah, and his dad like runs the company. That's kind of what. Yeah, I, yeah that's kind of what I figured the situation oh, was. Some some little rich kid on his year abroad. Yeah. Yes. I'm gonna I'm gonna do something tough for a year. Mm. <laughs> he's fucking in the he's in the Peace Corps. He probably could have gotten away with literally murdering anybody else on that ship, and that one kid that died of fever is, yeah. is the wrong one. I would have just been like, he's a fucking soft hands. Of course he died of fever. <laughs> So to kind of, uh, you know, wipe his hands clean of the situation, he moves on to a bigger uh, three-mast ship called the Betsy. Does that wipe his hands of it? He just kind of... Uh, he just left. left. <laughs> yeah. just got him. Is that wiping your hands of it in any way whatsoever? <laughs> <laughs> well, we've talked about this, right? It was, it was at a time where as long as you, you know, were out of frame and out of mind... Yeah. Yeah, you just move on to another the ship, things, you, you, you move to another part of the world, and nobody hears from you again. The things you could get away with, I'm just going to say prior to World War II, essentially, as a cutoff, were just phenomenal. And even then, there were like hundreds of active serial killers in like the 70s. So really, anything prior to 1980, the things you could get away <laughs> with, just goddamn bananas. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, so John... On the bets, he made a pretty penny for the time, but the ship was constantly having maintenance issues with leaks and holes, and he faced a mutiny a time or two, uh, most notably in uh, Tobago, where the ringleader, twice his size, named Blackton. Blackton. Um, I don't know if that's his government name. Probably. 
Probably not his government name. Blackton? Yes. B-L-A-C-K-T-O-N? B-L-A-C-K-T-O-N, yes. He's probably, that probably means he's f- like the son of a blacksmith or something. And no, no, it was just a giant black man. Uh, oh. yeah, that's yeah. what I was going to no, say. It was, it was just, just a huge black guy. Yeah, it was a giant guy from Tobago. Oh, okay. So, yeah, yeah just a big black guy. Just a big black guy that yeah. they just called Blackton. Well, to be fair, that is how most last names came about. True. And it's like, hey, you're this. Yeah. So, so that's your last name now. Blackton had a problem with, uh, with Paul, took a swing with a club at his head, which, of course, he's 5'5", five five, so he ducked it pretty easily uh, and came back and stabbed the giant brute through the midsection with a sword and down the much bigger man who was actually a, a Tobago local. Okay. Uh-oh. So Honestly, he doesn't feel like that big of an upset since he had the sword. He, had, yeah. <laughs> he was a uh, low man wins, you know? Yeah, well, sword man wins usually, too, <laughs> when there's only one sword man. You don't bring a club <laughs> no, to a sword fight. you don't. <laughs> was he a popular local? Uh, yes. So oh, fearing Uh-oh. he would not get a fair local trial because Blackton's connections to the area or a fair trial in Admiral's Court, since the first mutineer who died on the John of Yellow Fever's family was actually very influential in this space, he dipped out and added the uh, Jones alias to the end of his name. Mm. Yeah, it's kind of ironic. Uh, a white guy worried that he's not going to get a fair trial. Yeah. And where was it? He was Tobago? Is yeah. it Tobago or uh, Tobago? Tobago. Trinidad and Tobago. Yeah, yeah. Tobago. But I mean, Tobago, Tobago. Tobago. They're probably both wrong. <laughs> Tobago, Tobago. Yeah. Let's call the whole thing off. So uh, Captain Paul killed those mutineers, either with his blade or some type of sea voodoo, but... Captain Paul Jones never spilled blood. No, that's why. Did he hyphenate it? No, there's never no hyphen. So either. Paul just became his middle name. So it's just Captain Paul Jones. Okay, John Paul Jones. Yeah, I like how the least sketchy thing about him so far is that he traded slaves. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, and how old was he at that point? Roughly uh, when he uh, when he stabbed Blackton. Uh, so he is about twenty two at this time. Jesus, it, what a life! Already traded slaves. Became the captain of his own ship. It's pretty much been sailing for a decade at this point. Yeah. Yeah. I I did not accomplish nearly that much. What a life. To. And we're not even halfway done. Uh, he sought refuge and laid low with his brother William in Fredericksburg, Virginia. So he's down again in Fredericksburg, <laughs> leaving his wife behind. <laughs> Babe, my fucking brother's here and he had two mutinies against him just going out. <laughs> just, bitch, shut the fuck up. <laughs> just watch the kids. Uh, during this time, he becomes a Mason uh, and eventually settles down in Philadelphia, where he meets some of the uh, colony's political elites like Jan- John Hancock <sighs> and, uh, of course, Benny Franklin. Joining the Masons is a long way from fuck corporations. Yeah. <laughs> just, just four years later. Wait, was he actually, was, was he a, a normal Mason Mason or one of the, one of the Freemasons? Uh, or were they one and the same back then? Were they one and the same? I, if you said he joined the Masons, it probably means he joined the Freemasons. Freemasons. That's I would, what I would think. I would guess. Okay. I don't think he took up Masonry. Well, yeah, if he's <laughs> rubbing shoulders with Ben Franklin and John Hancock. He's a Freemason then. Yeah. 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 I doubt Whew. they're out there laying bricks. Uh, so he's kind of chilling in Philly until uh, 1775 after the battles of Lexington and Concord. John Paul Jones offers up his services to the, not, the new Continental Navy, which was essentially just a bunch of merchantmen and fishermen converted into a pirate navy. Uh, it was about as dog shit as you could possibly imagine. Real bad. Really, really bad. Like going against the world's greatest navy. Yes. It, to the point where I, I know like Lafayette gets all the love from the America as far as like the French com- commander in the American Revolution and stuff like that. But we really wanted France and Spain, who like also doesn't get like any credit in the American Revolution, really, but they joined too. We really wanted them for the Navy. Like the, the ground troops were nice and, and helpful for sure. Yeah, but I remember that scene in The Patriot. Yeah, it was the <laughs> Navy that we really fucking needed and not even to like beat the British Navy, just to occupy them. Like, just to take up their time. Because otherwise, there's, there was n- almost nothing we could do to do like to make any dent against these people. Except John Paul Jones. 
Yes, which we'll get to. Uh, so Jones' potential would likely have gone unrecognized were it not for the endorsement of Richard Henry Lee, who was familiar with his past life and knew of his abilities. That would be uh, Robert E. Lee's father. Really? Is it? That Light Horse Harry Lee? Yeah. Richard Henry Lee? Yeah. A.K.A. Light Horse Harry Lee? I didn't know that. Wow. Yeah. I'm learning something today. Apparently. <laughs> <laughs> well... Yeah, that's compli- his kid's complicated. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one guy, he, Light Horse Harry Lee was, uh, pr- I, would th- I would say, a top five or six American commander in the, in the revolution. Uh, yeah, hu- hugely influential American Revolutionary uh, Army commander uh, ca- of the cavalry, I think, hence Light Horse. But uh, yeah. His son is uh, Robert E. Lee. So with Richard Henry Lee and uh, his connects, obviously, with Hancock, with Benny Franklin, with uh, some of his Mason boys, uh, Jones is appointed the first lieutenant of the newly converted 24-gun USS Alfred in the Continental Navy on December 7th, 1775. Uh, they captured prize ships, including valuable merchant vessels, and destroyed anti-ship artillery. They captured a cargo of 10,000 complete winter uniforms and other equipment, which were essential, and uh, they were sent to old George Washington in Valley Forge. He kept our boys warm. Kept our boys warm. Also weird that he was appointed on uh, Pearl Harbor Day. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Do you think the Japanese... Uh, Factored that into the attack. Was, I think it was huge. Yeah, I think they were like, "This was the this is the day, we have to do it." If there was an actual ship in Pearl Harbor that was named after John Paul Jones that got bombed, I think that would have all but confirmed. <laughs> There's a non-zero chance. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's who we name boats after. It's, it's like states and people, famous Americans. Yeah. So John Paul Jones continued his patrol of like the New England coast until July of 1777 when he took charge of the newly built Ranger, named in honor of American Rifleman. The Ranger was a, uh, a constructed warship and not a converted merchant vessel. So like, he actually has a real, a real warship Finally, now. yeah. Uh, on November 1st, 1777, uh, All Saints Day. Yeah. Uh, the Ranger set sail for France. Upon arrival, Jones reported to First Commissioner... Ben Franklin, who introduced him to high society in Paris. Mm. So he, and this is how he do. Most well, likely introduced him to milfs also. Yeah. Well, well Gilf, was he was more of a gilf guy at that oh, point. Oh yeah, he liked him real old. Yeah. Well, he was real old. And he was just, <laughs> age appropriate for Ben. Yeah. I mean, Ben yeah. was dragging his dick through whatever he felt like, or whatever would go his way. And so was John Paul Jones. All right. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I like to fucking hear. So he introduces him to uh, Paris society and also international politics. Uh, more on that later. Uh, he captured more prize vessels and launched raids on the British coast. So he's just kind of going as a pirate, just hitting uh, the British coast, the British Isles. That is actually an interesting thing people don't realize when you hear about naval, naval battles from this era and even like the Civil War. Like one of the, I forget who it was. I think the Alabama was the Confederate ship, but there is a famous battle with the Alabama and a Union ship, and uh, it's one of the bigger like ship duels of the Civil War. But it happened off the coast of France. Really? Yeah, and actually, what they were both uh, docked in the same port or something like that in France. But the French are like, "You're not doing this here. <laughs> get like, out of our water. Yeah. Take it outside. Yeah, like you're allowed to dock here and get some food or whatever. But like, yeah, take it out to the international waters." <laughs> Fuck. And they were like, I think they were maybe even escorted by French warships. Like, you go do it out there. <laughs> They're like referee. Yeah, and whoever doesn't die can come back, I guess. But. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so sailing back, he sailed back to Whitehaven, which is kind of where he originally came out of when he was 13. So he's very familiar with the waters. Um, so he sailed to Scotland? Yeah. Did he make No, Gordon? Whitehaven uh, is in, like Cumberland. So like. The UK? Still UK. England? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, I guess you, you, Scotland is UK, but yeah, England, okay. Mm-hmm. Although, some t- I mean, they tried to get their independence, Rob, a few years back. More than once. More than once. But still the UK, despite how hard they try. Um, despite a nearly mutinous crew, some of whom straight up ignored his orders to go to a nearby pub, he successfully took out the guns at Whitehaven without spilling any blood, adding luster to his reputation. 
But it was pretty useless for the war. Like, knocking out some guns in England literally does nothing <laughs> yeah. for American independence at all. It did. Well, if anything, it would just piss off the locals. Well, that's what it did. And make them more dedicated to right. beating the Americans. So the English newspapers were filled with rumors of John Paul Jones' appearance off many of coastal towns and painted him as a pirate thug. Yeah, it seems wildly counterproductive to send anyone over there to do anything other than sink ships sending troops to America. Yeah. Well, in April of 1778, uh, he made a strange and daring daylight raid on the Earl of Selkirk's mansion, though it did not go as planned. Okay. Uh, the captain's real purpose in the raid was to kidnap the Earl and exchange him for captured U.S. sailors who were treated as pirates and hanged accordingly instead of prisoner of war. Um, unfortunately for Jones, the Earl was not at home. Just not there. Well, you got to try, I guess. <laughs> at this time, wouldn't they have been considered privateers? Since they're, they're sanctioned by the, well, I guess the U.S. doesn't, well, it's got kind of a fledgling government at that time. But. I, they probably don't consider, I guess, I guess they would, not, would maybe say, like, you're not a legitimate government, so. Yeah, okay. You're acting sense. in your, because I guess, uh, you know, some pirate could be like, no, we're, I have this little spot on. Yeah, they so also used to. Legit. Yeah. They used to sail under some, uh, you know, they might have committed some war crimes here before there was war crimes. Were there war crimes back then? Uh, yeah, n- yeah, there was rules of engagement. Because they would sail under, like, British flags and then be like, gotcha, bitch. That was definitely a war crime at yeah, the time. Yeah, I was going to say, for I, sure. I think that, that wearing an enemy's uniform and, yeah, and things yeah, like yeah. that were, were punishable by death. There were espionage laws, for sure. Like, you couldn't do that type of thing. Absolutely not. Um, and then there was, like, less, like, official things, like, don't shoot officers, you know, like, you should be aiming at the privates or whatever. Like, yeah, it's, aim it, at the people that don't have money. Yeah, well, I mean, like, it was a thing uh, in the American Revolution at the Battle of... Uh, I don't think it was Saratoga, because I don't think Washington was there. I, can't, I really actually can't remember. But um, thank, thank you. Thank you, Joel. Thank you, Joel. But uh, there was some battle where some sniper had Washington in, in his crosshairs, but it was ungentlemanly to no shoot a general. Way. Yeah. No, yeah, like, had Washington And this is why up. we beat England. Yeah, <laughs> because we didn't care. We didn't give a fuck. We definitely threw those window or threw those rules out the window by the time the Civil War rolled around. Uh, yeah, those were all gone by the yeah. time the Civil War was there because so many fucking generals got killed in the Civil War. So since the Earl wasn't there, he just stole a bunch of fucking silver because uh, his crew was a little unruly and they wanted to at least have some type of yeah, return. Well, not. Uh, but he left a note and he told uh, Lord Selkirk and his lady. Uh, he apologized, and he would return the silver. <laughs> <laughs> what? Why? He's just like, I need this so my crew doesn't fucking turn on me again. War was stupid back then. What? Just fucking take it. Yeah, Burn right. his house down. It's like Who you cares? were about to kidnap this man, and now you're going to apologize yeah. for taking the silver? <laughs> like... <laughs> just burn his fucking house down. Take his shit and burn it down. Who cares? I mean, still feels pretty counterproductive i mean it probably jacks up the americans like they're like yeah we're sticking it to england or whatever but like everything he does is like the Doolittle raid but less <laughs> like it's it's just not doing anything for anyone except making the other side like more entrenched in their belief maybe maybe that's why he left the note is because he yeah. was like i know i'm just pretty much recruiting more troops for the war yeah. effort. So I'll just leave this nice apology note over here and maybe they'll forgive me for it. Like think about how much more popular the Vietnam war would have been here in the United States. If like once a year there was a Vietnamese suicide bomber in like a market on the West coast. <laughs> People would be way more into the Viet. They'd be like, yeah, man, finish the job. Yeah. Fuck. <laughs> Shortly after that, he and the crew the took out. really missed their chance. They, they really did. <laughs> yeah. uh, so John Paul Jones and his crew uh, shortly after took out the HMS Drake. Her decks ran with blood and rum, and they captured over 200 prisoners in the process. So he's starting to, starting to you know, All right. do his thing. Starting to hit his stride. Sounds like a sort of a Caribbean Bloody Mary, if you will. <laughs> 
You know, just a salty, boozy drink. Sailor's blood and rum. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That yeah, sounds yeah. real good. That blood's probably real clean, too. Mm-hmm. Definitely yep. no hepatitis. Unfortunately, <laughs> though, this scurvy. is this is off the coast of England. So, like, he's, he's he sailed across the Atlantic, and he's just hitting up. Just fucking shit up. And then, I, what, going to France or Ireland, I guess? He always, yeah, re goes back to France. Because, okay. obviously, him and Benny are yeah. hitting up the brothels and doing just, their thing. Yeah. It's French. Yeah, but- how much time did he spend writing apology notes after he took the Drake? <laughs> yeah, seriously. 200 people? That's a lot of it's just like, I'm sorry I slit your throat. My crew was kind of antsy. Uh, I don't want another I'll, mutiny on my I'll hands. Sew, yeah, that. I'll sew your throat back together later. <laughs> that's, two, that's at least 200 apology notes to uh, the families of the crew that he took prisoner. Yeah. yeah. Well, so. again, it's crew, so... How many families? Not really? all my yeah. families. <laughs> It's there's like ninety orphans and like at least twenty of them were like husbands that just left their family. They didn't want need the letter anyway. Like no, don't send the letter. My wife's gonna figure out where I am. Yeah, just, just fucking throw me in the ocean if you're gonna do that. In February 1779, the captain was given command of a large ship designed to carry heavy guns. It was called uh, Duck de Duras. Uh, but John Paul Jones renamed it the Bonheim Richard in honor of his friend Benjamin Franklin, who wrote and published Bonham. Poor, the Bonham, Bonham Richard, Bonham Richard. Okay, published Poor Richard's Almanac. Yeah, so I think Bonham Richard means Poor Richard. Poor Richard. Yeah, in French. Yeah, or something. It's yeah. kind of strange that there's there's two subtle Led Zeppelin references in this overall story because you got John Paul Jones, mm-hmm. the bass player from Led Zeppelin, and then you got John Bonham, the yeah. Uh, the, drummer from Led Zeppelin. Strange the connection. Yeah. Although Bonham means good man, I think. Yeah, it's crazy that John Paul Jones so was like, a huge know. Led Zeppelin fan. Yeah, yeah well, that's weird. <laughs> it's fucking wild. He was into him way before. Uh, wait, hold on. I thought there was going to be more talk of John Paul Jones uh, and Ben Franklin broing down on French Oh, Chicks. it's after this. Is that? That's after this. Oh, okay, yeah, okay, yeah. okay. Yeah, yeah, we'll get to that. All right. Well, I didn't know if you. I didn't know if you were just like, yeah, that happened, and then you're moving on, or what. I just want to see what John Paul Jones does with someone like 40 years older than him. <laughs> <laughs> <In> fr- <laughs> It'd be and like then- literally. I, I mean this literally, almost me and my dad, <laughs> just going bananas in Paris. <laughs> well. Abigail Adams, we'll just skip to this real quick, uh, the wife, obviously, of future President John Adams. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is what she wrote of John Paul Jones. Uh, Under all this appearance of softness, he is bald, bold, enterprising, ambitious, and active. He has been here often and dined with us several times. He is said to be a man of gallantry and a favorite amongst the French ladies. Oh. All right. I feel like she probably had a thing for him, too. Uh, the way she's speaking about him? I don't know. She's pretty into John, but her and John got down. They were, were they swingers? swingers? No, but they were just like married couple that oh. like to get after it. They, they were very, down. they were, yeah, they were very, they were very, you know, they were in love. They were like a real marriage. God, that sweet. must have smelled terrible back then. I can't fucking imagine. Yeah, I but like you kind of really, get used to it now. I guess, well, that's all you know, right? Well, yeah, eventually. It, you don't know cleanliness. Yeah, yeah, you don't know what stink is unless you know what not stink is. Right. So if you're just surrounded by stink It's all just the, time, the baseline. Yeah. 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 yeah, thank God for them. Or else <laughs> that would have been horrible. It's a fucking nightmare. Although, again, I don't know. Everyone Anything, was much... Yeah. There might maybe, that's one of the reasons, I guess, everyone was much drunker back then. Yeah. <laughs> right? Like, to be. to be an alcoholic in, like, the 17th, 16th, 18th century, 19th century, even early, early 20th century... It's just a that's just a different galaxy it was a, of what is considered an alcoholic now. Yeah, it was a necessity. Well, I remember you guys the uh, show that you did about uh, Malloy. The, yeah. yeah, yeah. He was the one that was drinking the wood alcohol. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Good lord. Yeah. Iron Mike Malloy. Go ahead and listen to the back catalog if you haven't already. All the episodes are evergreen, but yeah. Irish hobo episode. Yeah. Mike Malloy. The unkillable what? Irish hobo is, I would say, maybe my favorite episode. One of our better episodes, I believe. I but, really yeah. enjoyed that one. So go ahead and if, listen to that if you haven't already. If you have, maybe go back and listen to it again. I don't care. What I like to say is leave it on for the dog. Yeah. 
You have a home. You have a home. Do I have an Alexa or something or a Google Home? Just leave it on for the dog. Yeah, just leave. And then it just kind of goes through all of our yep. old episodes. Yeah, just yeah. cycle through a while. Leave it on for the dog. That yeah. I think if I ever nothing but bang. If I ever had a TV show or whatever, that would be like the fucking advertisement. It's like, yeah, watch <laughs> it or not, but it's on Hulu. Leave it on for the dog. <laughs> That's a pretty good business plan, honestly. Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, so at sunset on September twenty third, uh, seventeen seventy nine. They encountered the HMS uh, Serapis and the Countess of S- Scarborough. Escorted the what of Car- Scarborough? The Countess. Countess? Countess. So a lady. Well, it's a, it's a ship. They, I, they, I feel like ships are Oh, the, the ship was re- called the Countess of Scarborough. Yeah, okay. I feel like they're often referred to as, like, female. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't know if it was, like, a woman. It was a ship named No, these are two ships. Okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, escorting a fleet of 41 merchantmen, Jones got close by assuming the identity of a British vessel, vessel that resembled his own. So, again, flying British. Yeah, war, war crime. Yeah, war crime. This is the second episode that I've been on, but that's two episodes in a row where we're s- yeah. talking about some celebrated hero that was actually just a bit of a war criminal. A bit of a war criminal. <laughs> a bit of a war criminal, yeah. To make an omelet, you've got to crack a few eggs. You do. A few war crimes. Exactly. Uh, the battle lasted for several hours, leaving the Richard slowly sinking and on fire, leading to Jones making his famous uh, pronouncement. Wait, wait, what? Did, someone said something to him first. What was said to him? Well, they, they said, they're pretty much asking, are you ready to surrender? Yeah. In which he responded, I have not yet begun to fight. His famous quote. So go ahead, Paul Brothers, if you want to take that. Yeah. That's a great quote for your business model now. I really hope that they never find out that they're related <laughs> to him. Well, it, in their defense, they've got a much better saying, it's every day, bro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what is it's every day, bro, but the modern I have not yet begun to fight? <laughs> really? Essentially, yeah. It was, it was, it was the 1700s version, version of Catch These Hands. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I have not yet begun to grind... <laughs> like it really so even though endless. he's surrounded by british ships his own ship itself is sinking is on, it's on fire and he's just like nah we're good yeah no uh that's i gotta say that's on par with like chesty polar during the korean war when uh i don't remember the the exact quote but during the korean war chesty polar i think it was a chosen reservoir possibly they were completely surrounded and one of his, uh, I think it was one of his, his uh, officers was reporting to him that, you know, there's Korean soldiers on every side of him. He's like, oh, those poor bastards, they, they don't have anywhere to run or something like that. Love that. Love that. General McAuliffe at Bastogne as well, when they were like, surrender. I actually don't get this. It must have just been slang at the time. Oh, nuts. Nuts! Yeah. Yeah. It was just like, <laughs> nuts. I don't know, like, nuts to that. <clears throat> That just, was a, the old school version. He just sent him a message, uh, essentially, that said Ligma. Yeah. Like, wait, send him another, another <laughs> message. What, what is Ligma? Yeah, he got to lead with Ligma. That's the problem. Yeah. <laughs> Somehow, though, the Americans actually uh, won this battle. To fight, despite their uh, boat being in the ocean, so, like inside <laughs> of the ocean. Big part of this win was due to uh, fellow Scotsman Bill Hamilton, who crawled across the Richards' main yard with a sack of grenades and tossed them into the main hatch of uh, the uh, Serapis, uh, touching off an explosion of powder cartridges. After. So he pretty much went after the gunpowder and blew that shit up. Yeah. So Made it go boom, boom. What happens in like action movies now when like an explosion makes a bigger explosion is typically not real, but it used to be very real. Because <laughs> yeah, everything was just about ready to explode. Yeah. Then. Well, their whole powder magazine, for sure. Right. It was just like, they just put explosives in a pile of wood. Yeah, what's and a 1779 <laughs> grenade? Yeah. It's just... Uh, I don't know. I think it's just like a... I mean, they had grenades back then because they were grenadiers and stuff. I, I really have no idea what a fucking grenade looked like back then. I mean, I think, isn't that where the... The old school, like Looney Tunes style bomb. bomb with the the fuse sticking out. Oh of it. yeah, probably. I think you're right. It's just yeah. a stick Something of like dynamite. <laughs> no, no, no. It's like the little metal bomb, you yeah, know, with like the classic, like black. in Mario, like the little uh, bombs that walk yeah, around. Yeah. With the little fuse sticking. Yeah, out yeah, of the top yeah. Of it. 
Okay, so after the explosion, the devastation, Captain Pearson of the uh, Serapis surrenders. In Jones' blasted and ruined luxury cabin, Pearson offered his host his sword, and the two men cordially drank glasses of wine as the poor Richard continued to sink beneath them. So they, he surrenders in John Paul Jones' cabin as On the ship sinking. sinking. Ship? Yes. So where did they go? <laughs> what the fuck? They're just in John Paul Jones' like luxury cabin. Well, they didn't stay there. Well, not yet, but they're drinking wine. Okay. They gotta they gotta talk over the surrender, and then they're yeah. just boozing together. There's like they're like uh, while all the pores are match, outside, mate. bleeding like, to death, <laughs> <laughs> drowning and getting eaten by sharks. Yeah. Like there's just like wailing outside. They're like. Ah! I'd say they're screaming for their family. We know it's a family out there. Well, yeah. Both <laughs> but, crews. Like, they're still sad that they're dying. And then these two are just like, fuck, dude. Both crews. That was a rad fight. Do we get drunk now? <laughs> they, high-fiving each other. Yeah. They sustained heavy casualties, and Jones received a head wound. Uh, Richard's crew was transferred to the captured Serapis and the other American ships. Although Jones tried hard to save the Richard, she sank beneath the waves the following day, taking some of Jones' belongings with him. Oh no! Oh no! He lost. What, that. He lost like a fucking painting or something. <laughs> what? How many possessions did he even have back then? Like he didn't lose his phone. Like, what? He, his laptop didn't go under the water. Oh, what the God. fuck was there? He had his sword on him and his the sword he took. Considering the time period, yeah, some of those possessions might have included people. <laughs> I really hope not. Yeah. Well, we already we already crossed that bridge. He thought it was morally wrong. Yeah, that's true. He was no longer a blackbird. Well, oh, well, morally wrong to trade them if they're already. Caught. Yes. Right. It's like, well, I don't know what Apple did, but I mean, I have to buy this laptop. <laughs> I do need a laptop. Uh, so his victory inspired his French allies and the young country that was very much embroiled with land battles. What uh, what year was that? 1779. The, that battle was? Yeah. Okay. He received many military honors and a special gold medal, which he helped design. Ah, well. One side showed his handsome profile, and the other had a likeness of a victorious but doomed uh, the Bonham Richard. Okay. The poor Richard. Uh, his rock star status, good looks, and gentle manners earned him much appreciation. The French king Louis uh, the Sixteenth. It's Louis when it's French, but Louis, yes, Louis the Sixteenth. Yeah, uh, gave him the Order of Military Merit, which allowed him to sign his name. Uh, is it Chevalier Paul Jones? Yeah, uh, which he sometimes did. Um, so he was knighted by the French. Yes, essentially. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so he's a French knight. He's a French knight. Yeah. Um, he left without a proper rank as Congress chose to give him a gold medal rather than a position after the war. Uh, so John Paul Jones was a free agent. He helped win the Revolutionary War. He's right. A, he's a knight. I guess he's knighted by the French. Uh, but now... Even though you're not allowed to hold, hold titles as an American. Well, the, this is young America. Yeah, maybe they hadn't... I feel they like that really, was one of their early stipulations. We haven't but worked that out yet. Had they... Hadn't they? <laughs> I felt like uh, half the point. So, you know, he kind of got down with the French, uh, with Benny Franklin. He's got that title. He's hitting up a lot of, uh, you know, local brothels. He, right. He can do no wrong. He has done no wrong. So, I mean, aside from the slave trading, he's done no wrong so far. <laughs> aside from that little thing. Yeah, yeah. But he, he rebelled was, eventually. He was young, and it was a long time ago. <laughs> I was young. Yeah. Yeah, well, the war crimes, well, yeah, too. The, the, war and the war crimes. crimes. Multiple previous war crimes. Yeah. Uh, All's well that ends well. Yeah. <laughs> so after the war, John Paul Jones takes up uh, kind of, she, he has a fancy with uh, Russian Empress Catherine the Great, Ooh. who offers uh, to command her navy. He performed well in the... What years of this? What is, that year? a, is that a euphemism also? Was it Catherine the Great, the, the one that was uh, fond of horses? Or am I thinking of a, a different queen? Uh, I don't know. I believe you're correct there. Coop. Uh, she liked horses? Mm-hmm. 
Sorry if I'm jumping ahead in the story. No, uh, he performed well in the uh, Lyman campaign against the Turks in the Black Sea. So um, this is so many people fight the Turks. I know everyone fights the Turks. Everyone fights John the Turks. John Smith at some point. fought the Turks. Yeah. Um, he was also on a ship. Um, I know we we kind of breezed over this earlier, but John Smith was a sl- he was a captured uh, sex slave. No, no, he wasn't a sex slave, but he was a. Uh, he was arrested on a boat, and then when they got to the colony in Virginia, they're like, you're in charge now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but he was a slave of the Turks, and he also, as a slave, had sex with oh, one a lot of, of the Turkish women. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. A Turkish noblewoman. So go ahead and listen to the John Which kind of makes him a was, sex slave a little bit. Like, yeah. how much choice do you have at that? I mean, maybe it was consensual, I don't know, life. but like, you don't really yeah, say no. Yeah, you can't no. really say no in that situation. Right. Uh, so the queen's favorite, um, he just kind of became besties with probably, uh, he probably boned the queen of Russia, the Russian, uh, Catherine he definitely the fucked Catherine the Great. Yeah. He fucked Catherine the Great. If it's the queen that I'm thinking of, then it, I would be much more surprised if he didn't. Then did? Uh, yeah, yeah. Because if it's the, like I said, if it's the queen that I'm thinking of, she was, uh, she was down for that kind of thing to put it lightly. For fucking. All the time. All right. I like that about Catherine the Great. Wasn't she... No, she wasn't the one. She was, like, pretty brutal, wasn't she? I'm not sure. Ruling-wise? I can't remember. I would imagine by today's standards, most of them were. Or actually, wait, was Catherine the Great the one that the uh, peasants were... Not the peasants. What do you... I forget what you call them. The serfs. Wasn't... Didn't she, like, liberate them? Emancipate them? Because the, sure. the Russian serfs were emancipated the same year as the emancipation... Emancipation Proclamation in 1862, but this this would predate that unless Catherine the Great was pretty young. Well, either yeah, way, she would have been real young because I was like over 70 years before that. Because we're in the what 1780s or something like that. Uh, yeah, we're 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 getting into the 80s now. Um, a little jelly though, a little jealous of uh, our man here, because uh, he's still fucking, just fucking his way through Russia, uh, and she doesn't really want to share. So uh, wait, so he's fucking other chicks in Catherine the Great's Russia. Yeah, that's bold. Yeah, <laughs> in that country especially. Continues to enjoy women who offered themselves up, uh, and eventually a uh, fresh-faced peddler girl makes him a proposition, um, and that goes down, um, and he's essentially set up for rape. Okay. Wait, in that time period? Yeah. Seems like that's kind of hard to do. Yeah. Wait, and she was just a pedal, like she was a peasant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I so, didn't even think that they would prosecute that. Popular way. sentiment rose right. against him, although it was later revealed that the girl was not exactly telling the truth. That doesn't sound shocking based on what you said about Catherine the Great. Yep, it came to light that this was probably, probably a political plot created by the enemies he made while in Russia, including... His homegirl. Oh, no. <laughs> Why would you cheat on the emperor? I mean, I guess you just, any, you're just taking anything at that point. Yeah. I don't think he really, uh, you know, kind of considered the consequences of put, where he put his dick. Well, he didn't consider the consequences of a sinking boat. Yeah. Or if, if the guy is gonna, slave trading or... Well, well he, did. he did eventually he did do that. that. But um, eventually. Uh or ruining his brother's marriage by broing down too much <laughs> in downtown Fredericksburg. So as this goes down and they're about to crack down and prosecute him, he bails, obviously. You gotta get the fuck out of Mother Russia. Yep, yep, time to go. Returns to Paris. Uh, during this time, the French were experiencing their own revolution, and his health was very poor. Although the Swedes did offer him the chance to fight against his old Russian pals, uh, he died in debt on July 18th, 1792, before he could accept any offer uh, for a forthcoming position as either uh, a Swedish commander or anything in the U.S. He was 45, uh, and uh, that was a pretty eventful 45 years. Uh, fairly. Wait, how did he die, though? Yeah. Get the fever like that guy he killed? It's <laughs> probably old age at this point, 45. Did, had he ever been wounded in battle? Head injury. 
head injury yeah during that uh, battle war ship but what does that mean like knocked in the head bullet graze like an infection situation like, like what are we talking homeboy threw grenades and there was explosions maybe he took like a chunk of wood to the head i mean there's explosions all over the place with him he's in battles left and right so Jones' French friends paid for the funeral, and he was buried in a lead-lined coffin in the cemetery for uh, Protestant foreigners. Was he? Was he radioactive? Yeah. <laughs> At this point, he is. Why? Why was he in the? <laughs> I do like that they were like, "Well, we can't put him in the Catholic cemetery." Obviously. <laughs> During the revolution, by the way, as they were like, "Fuck the Catholic Church," like they were trying to like tear down the uh, Catholic Church, was, like the second estate, I believe. Uh, yeah. It's funny. They're just like, well, we got to keep it, keep it good here for the, for the Catholics. He was actually moved in 1905 uh, when American authorities located his coffin in the now overbuilt cemetery. They were able to find it relatively easy because it was lined with lead. Well, they have a metal detector? Like, <laughs> I think so, yeah. yeah. Well, I'm also still just confused on why the, the lead-lined coffin. Was that a yeah. common thing for them to be doing back in those days? Well, I, I mean, lead was in everything. Oh, true. <laughs> I guess. Well, why is it noteworthy then? It well, seems like it's it was noteworthy because they were able to find the coffin in 1905 because it was lead based. Okay. Yeah. So it's easy to kind of just get that. So the body was moved back to America um, and shown on 11 battleships. Uh, Wait, we showed the body? The coffin. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Fredericksburg was among the places uh, that was where they considered putting his final resting place, but he ended up in the Naval Academy Chapel in Annapolis. Seems fair. Mm -hmm. Father of the Navy, why not? And uh, that is the story of John Paul Jones. So what what are your thoughts? What are your your takeaway from uh, who is the better John Paul Jones? Well, I'm honestly surprised that there was such a large quantity of sex in this John Paul Jones story uh, because there was also a whole bunch of sex and the other John Paul Jones mm-hmm. story, the one from, from Led Zeppelin, mm-hmm. which I'm mm-hmm. disappointed that we didn't get to talk about the, the Mud Shark story up in, in Seattle. Well, go ahead. Uh, yeah, just, well, enlighten us, for the love of God. Uh, have you guys not heard the, the story of Led Zeppelin in the, the hotel up in Seattle? I think it was Seattle, somewhere in Washington. Uh, they, so they were all having a party. It was them and this other band called Vanilla Fudge, and Vanilla Fudge was a group that actually helped Led Zeppelin get their start. And they brought a groupie up to their room. She was totally just high as a kite. I mean, I feel like probably as one does in the seventies, sixties. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the way the hotel was set up, it was out over the. I think it was a Puget Sound. So guests at the hotel were able to fish out of the window. They could just go out on their balcony or out the window, and cast a line, and reel in fish. Well, the guys from Led Zeppelin had caught a mud shark. Well, any of the fish that they were catching, they were putting in a makeshift aquarium that they made out of their bathtub. They just filled it up with water, and they were tossing the fish in there. And as one does, yeah. 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 yeah, I mean, obviously. It's a you, hotel bathtub. You toss some salt you know. in there, and it's perfect. Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> so this groupie came up to the room uh, insisting on making a movie because they, they found out that they had a, a camera there. So I think it was... Uh, I think it was Jimmy Page and Robert Plant decided to fulfill her wish of making a movie and they took the mud shark and at first well they had her get naked climb onto the bed and they tied her to the bed and then they started whipping her with the the now dead body of the mud shark and then from there's a few different versions of the story but from the the most consistent versions have them cutting the shark up into pieces and then putting those pieces inside of the groupie ah. and not through the uh, entrance that you usually put food in. Ah. Mm. Mm. Both of the other entrances ah. that you normally put food in. Okay. And apparently there, somewhere in the world there exists an old school bit of footage of this happening, but from what I can tell, nobody's ever seen it or found it. I hope that's destroyed. And not I- for Led Zeppelin's sake. Just I don't think sake. it's off the table to say this John Paul Jones also did that. Uh, I would not be surprised. Yeah. If he was hanging out with Catherine the Great. Uh, yeah, if he was hanging out with her. Any, any, really, any Russian royalty, hey, well, nothing's this, off the table. This is also, uh, uh, this is actually just so happens to be during the same time period of the last episodes that we were doing on the Iconoblast podcast. We were talking about Marquis de Sade. And this is during the same time period. And the stuff that he was coming up with back then, the ideas that he had and the things that he did, honestly worse than any musicians that I've uh, 
ever heard of. Yeah. Well, you got to think about it. He's been on the open sea since he was 13. You have nothing but time. Idle hands. Yeah. (laughs) A lot of things went through that brain. Yeah. Just looking out on a flat. You got to keep yourself busy somehow. See. Yeah. Yeah. Eventually you get bored. Start thinking of ways to do weird shit. Although Led Zeppelin's like the opposite because they had plenty of stuff to do. And then they just still did that because they had done everything. Right? So it's the other thing. Like if hands are too busy or hands are too, like you just need a medium. You get bored either direction you yes. go. Yes. Right. Yeah, yeah, right yeah. there at the top of the bell curve. Yeah. Those things you, it's where you want to be. <laughs> What'd you guys learn today? Anything? Uh, I don't fucking know. Life, uh, life was complicated back then. Uh, it really just, what I learned is that as long as I'm near something, I'm kind of adjacent to it, right? Yeah. <laughs> That's what I learned. Yeah, he was noble, noble adjacent. Noble adjacent. I'm all sorts of adjacent. Coop, how about you? Uh, I think what I learned today is that sometimes rebellious teenagers can land on the, uh, <laughs> the right idea. Mm-hmm. By rebelling, because uh, yeah, went against slavery. Despite dumb luck, yeah, good. yeah, against the slave. Well, against the slave trade. Against the slave trade. Yeah, I we don't know how he felt. We I don't know how he felt about homegrown he, slaves. He, he was anti-slavery adjacent. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think, in a sense, it was kind of like a blanket for yeah anti-slavery. At some point, we thought uh, it was more well. Wrong. Here's the thing: the Adamses were noted abolitionists, and I didn't hear any of that from him necessarily. So much. Maybe as he, he saw would, the light. Yeah. Well, the, the, the Adams from the beginning, I mean, John Adams was a pragmatist, so he was like, I mean, that's just not going to happen. Do you think he fucked the, Abigail Adams? I don't. Okay. I think Abigail was pretty. She seemed taken by him. Dude, what? Martha Washington said that uh, Alexander Hamilton was a tomcat or something. It's whatever. Like, they just, like, the married woman would write about the, the non married men and just be like, yo, oh, he's the devil. I think also he, she was like, Decently older than him. Could you imagine though if all the founding fathers just fucking swap wives? That'd be pretty funny. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we've considered that, but yeah, um, nah, it's still on the table. I mean, if there was anyone down to do that, it'd be Jefferson, since I don't think he had a wife. Mm, no, no, he didn't. Did he? I, Jefferson never married. I feel like he wasn't. I don't think so. Yeah, he, he had a kid with uh, Sally Hemings. Yeah, yeah. Which she was his John Smith. Yeah. <laughs> Is John oh, Smith what we're dark. calling it nowadays? Yeah. He John Smith there. <laughs> anyway, that is the story of John Paul Jones and the American Revolution. Um, yeah, make sure to uh, go back and check out any episode, including the John Smith episode, uh, that you haven't listened to already on Softcore History. All the content is this good, I think. I think all of our episodes have been fairly strong. Fair to. Fairly, fairly strong. Well, the ones with Jake are kind of whatever. Yeah, yeah. Like, skip over any one Jake does. Yeah, um, anything with Jake on it, don't listen. So you've got at least two episodes that you can listen to. Yeah, right? like two They're to three solid. that are pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> uh, make sure to go to the store, softcorehistory.com. we got some merch, uh, T-shirts, uh, Topsy Tees. We've been selling those. Uh, we're nowhere close to me getting the tattoo. Was it 1,000? We sell 1,000 1, T-shirts. shirts gets me uh, the Topsy logo tattooed it on my body. I think we're at, like, I don't know, like 30 yeah, go to softcorehistory.com. Just see that, or go to our Instagram at softcorehistory. You can see the logo. Dan will get that tattooed where? Um, I haven't decided yet, but it will be on my body and it will be visible. It yeah, it'll be prominent, right? It won't like be an ass tat. I mean, you have a visible frat tat, so. It might be on my arm or something. Yeah, yeah you're, you're not like, afraid of visible tattoos. No, no, we've, de- we've already talked about this. I am not afraid to litter my body with bad tattoos because at this point I am. Who cares? I'm already a waste. Yeah, yeah. me either. Yeah. <laughs> been doing it for you years. You got two sleeves. Yeah. Well, sleeve and a half. We're getting there. Uh, make sure to leave a review, five stars, if you uh, you care. Uh, yeah, tell a friend about the pod. Help us grow. Subscribe, unsubscribe, subscribe again. Um, and just, yeah, help us go up the charts. Tell a friend about the pod. We've been growing. Um, shouts to the state of Arizona, I guess. Yeah, Gilbert. Gilbert, Phoenix. Um, a, lot of, a lot of listeners in Arizona. Really? Really weird, yeah. Big Arizona podcast. <sighs> Maybe we'll have to do a meetup in Arizona. I don't know. Um, if you're in Arizona, make sure to leave that in the review. Um, yep. Yeah, you can also just grab your friend's phone, friends, family members, anything like that. Yes. And just without them knowing, subscribe. Steal, to the, subscribe to the steal the podcast, your mother's please. phone. 
it yeah, works surprisingly well. Steal your dad's phone. Please and thank you. Um, yeah, for uh, Coop Cooperson, because I refuse to call you Matt Cooper. Uh, I, I appreciate that. Yeah. Yep. Rob Fox. I'm Dan Regester. And you just got soft serve. Gold medaled. 